Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Royal Economic Society uh, special session on missing capitals, the sources of growth redefined. Uh, I'm Jonathan Haskell, uh, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. I'd like to thank the organizations involved for putting this special session together, the ONS, ESCO and the Productivity Institute. And I'd like to thank Bloomberg as well for very kindly uh, live streaming um, this session. Um, now, just by way of introduction, there's a lot of pressure on economists to make short term projections on what's going on month by month, week by week, or possibly even day by day. And that has its place, um, but not in this particular session. What, what this session gives you is a chance to uh, hear from and give some credit to um, those who are creating the bandwidth uh, to think in a more medium term way and look at the more medium term sort of structural prospects uh, for the economy. Now, one of the people um, who does that uh, and does that incredibly well uh, is my terrific colleague, Andy Haldane, who many of you will know. Um, he's been uh, extremely influential uh, and he's been a wonderful public servant uh, and an inspiring and original thinker. Uh, and I'm very sorry that he's leaving the bank where I have the honor to work, uh, uh, but he's the RSA's uh, gain. Fortunately, um, there are many other very talented economists who are also thinking about these kind of issues. Uh, and they are there on the screen in front of you um, today. Uh, Matthew Agarwala uh, is from Cambridge. Uh, Josh Martin uh, is from the ONS. Uh, Tara Allais is from uh, McKinsey. Uh, Adam Dutton is from the ONS. Uh, Andy Dickerson is from Sheffield. And Mary O'Mahony uh, is from Kings and um, ESCO. So thanks to all of them and thanks to all of you. Uh, so the running order uh, is that each speaker has got uh, 15 minutes and the discussion has got five minutes. That will leave us 20 minutes at the end. Please try and use the chat function to send through some questions. I have another screen on this side. So if I'm looking away, uh, it's not because I'm feeding the cat. It's because I'm looking at the chat and looking at the other screen. Uh, and I will try and curate the chat. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a chance to have um, a good interaction um, at the end. Uh, so without further ado, why don't we get going? Um, our first speaker is on natural capital. Uh, and it is Matthew uh, uh, Agawala. Um, Matthew, uh, why don't I turn the floor over to you? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that kind introduction. Um, so my name is Matthew. I'm an economist at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, and I'm delighted to be sharing some work that's co-authored with Giles Atkinson at the London School of Economics and Pablo Munoz at the United Nations. And the paper is titled Carbon Accounting for measuring sustainability under globalization. And as is often the case, you know, we learned lots of things we didn't entirely expect when we started out on the research. And one of the things that we learned is that accounting mechanisms are a bit like a CV or a reference letter in that what they reveal is interesting, but what they conceal is critical. And as we dove deeper and deeper into this work, we found that our current approach to carbon accounting actually conceals too much critical information. And that as economists, we have an obligation and an opportunity to do better. So what I'm gonna try and share with you today is our approach to try and move the discussion forward a little bit and add some perspective to the way that we measure carbon and account for carbon at the national and international level. Uh, the theoretical basis for this work, and indeed much of the work that we do at the Bennett, uh, comes from the theory of inclusive wealth. Now, I suppose it's possible that there are people who aren't familiar with this already, uh, but this is an extremely exciting year to be talking about inclusive wealth or comprehensive wealth or the capital's approach to sustainability. And it's exciting this year because we have just witnessed the publication of the landmark report by Professor Sarpartha Dasgupta on the economics of biodiversity. And that report sets out in forensic detail, in all of its elegance, the theory that underpins everything I'm going to try and explain today uh, throughout this talk. But that report is also 600 pages and I have 15 minutes. So you're going to have to satisfy yourselves with my brief synopsis, which is uh, perhaps not entirely fair to the, to the full theory. And I like to describe it with a simple analogy. Imagine that we're running a bakery. The size of the pie that we can produce in the future depends on the stock of ingredients that we have in the pantry. And if we are drawing down our stock of ingredients in the pantry, tomorrow's pie is smaller. 
Well, the theory of inclusive wealth tells us that economies operate in much the same fashion and that the level of prosperity that can be sustained into the future depends on the current management of the comprehensive portfolio of all of the assets that are available to that economy. And if we are shrinking that portfolio of assets, which includes the environment and human capital and social capital and infrastructure, if we are shrinking that portfolio, then future prosperity necessarily falls. And that's the basis from which I'm going to introduce our additional approach to carbon accounting. And I like this because it means that our carbon accounts are consistent with rigorous economic theory that has been commented on and improved and expanded by economists such as Solo and Arrow and Dasgupta and Heal and Pierce and any number of others as well. I also like it because this theory is consistent with the natural science. It is open to and easy to incorporate insights from climate science, ecological science, etc. And that makes it very easy to adapt to various different environmental contexts. And I'm going to try to convince you today that this accounting perspective for carbon is empirically achievable with the information that's available to us from our current stock of climate science models and economic models, but that our empirics will always improve as time goes on as we refine both the science and the economics. And one of the core insights that we get from this theory is that there's a clear sustainability rule, which is that in order to be on a sustainable path, our comprehensive wealth, our inclusive wealth, this stock of all of the assets cannot be falling consistently over time. And that gives us a management rule as well, which is that it's, it, we're in a Hartwick rule-like situation, which means that if we are drawing down any component of this wealth, we have to save to offset that reduction in the value of the portfolio. And so if I apply this way of thinking to one component of natural capital, specifically a stable climate system, right, which I think we can present as a capital asset because a stable climate pro provides the capacity for economic production well into the future. And we can invest in that climate capital by reducing emissions. And we can degrade and deplete and depreciate that climate capital by releasing emissions. And so in this framework, we know that greenhouse gas emissions reduce wealth, but the question remains for an accountant, whose wealth are we reducing when we release emissions into the atmosphere? And the answer to that question depends on some fairly arbitrary rules about the way we decide to develop our accounts. We could, for instance, develop a carbon accounting mechanism that attributes all of the loss of wealth to the countries that extract, for instance, the fossil fuels, because that's where they enter the global supply chain. Alternatively, we could think of an accounting system, which is the one we actually use, for instance, under the Paris Climate Agreement, that attributes the emissions to the countries that combust those fuels in the production of GDP, in the production of their output. But that leaves no liability, no responsibility, no uh, uh, responsibility for those who consume the goods uh, in their final consumption. And so we could instead des design an accounting framework that attributes the emissions to the countries that consume the final goods and services. And there's lots of economists who are working in this, and there's loads of great research on the debate between production and consumption-based accounting. But what I put to you is that all of these three, extraction, production, and consumption accounts, focus exclusively on the location of the emissions. But the location of emissions is driven by historical patterns of industrialization and trade. And it has nothing to do with which countries are going to actually suffer the damages, whose productive capacity is being reduced by global emissions. And that means it doesn't tell us which countries have to save to meet the Hartwick rule, to maintain non-declining wealth. For that, we need an additional accounting perspective. The supply chain for emissions doesn't stop with consumption. It goes one step further 
And we have to incorporate that, which is the damage that countries will suffer as a result of climate change. And these damage-based accounts are what we produce in this paper. It attributes the loss in wealth according to the location of the damages, which is more consistent with the theory of inclusive wealth and with the climate science. It's important to be thinking about these things in today's world because international trade is a large and growing share of gross world product. And now somewhere around 30% of global emissions are traded internationally um, through the goods and services that, that we trade. And that means that the geographic link between production and consumption and the final environmental consequences of production and consumption is becoming increasingly tenuous as supply chains grow. And so when we, the way that we analyze first the production and consumption is with a standard multi-regional input output model using the GTAP database. And when we look at production versus consumption accounts, we learn some interesting things about the world. So we see uh, here the 20 countries with the largest absolute value difference between production and consumption-based uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Those in green are net exporters. Those in red are net importers. And one of the first things to realize about this slide is what's not on the slide. So in between the smallest green and the smallest red line, we have about 120 countries for whom the value of the difference between production and consumption emissions is pretty minimal. But look at the countries we do have on the slide, China, India, the US, Japan, the UK. Here we have the majority of the world's population. We have the majority of the world's gross world product and we have the majority of the world's emissions. And so on that basis, this distinction between production and consumption accounts actually does matter. There's a, there's a substantial difference. And in those countries, tabulating accounts from these different perspectives will give us a different view of the world. But once again, this is still production and consumption. It's based on the location of the emissions. It doesn't tell us who suffers the losses and who suffers the damages. Now, ideally, what I would have in order to describe which countries suffer the losses as a result of global emissions is I would have a coefficient unique to each country that describes that country's share of the global damages that we expect to see from climate change. Right? Not the contribution to climate change, but the share of the losses that we expect to see from climate change. And if I had this coefficient, it could work with any quantity of emissions for any given year, and it could work with any carbon price, and I'm not tied down to one. Analysts could then take a look at these coefficients and use whatever carbon price they're required to by uh, their statutory regulations, and use whatever to uh, total global emissions there are in that given year to calculate their country's loss in wealth, their damage-based account. And that tells us which countries need to save more to offset the global externality that's imposed upon them. When we do this, what we find is that we get a completely different map of the world. All right? So what I'm showing you here are two maps. One of them shows those country level coefficients if we use the production-based perspective, the territorial emissions. And that's the approach that we use in the Paris Climate Agreement to determine our NDCs. In the lower panel, you see the coefficients that describe each country's share of the global damages under the damage-based perspective. And here I'm using uh, Burke et al. Uh, 2015 in Nature for the country-level damages, though the paper has uh, other papers as well um, for estimates of country-level damages. And what this tells us is not that one of these two perspectives is the correct way of looking at the world, but that neither of them is the complete way of looking at the world. And so what we see is that the different accounting perspectives gives us a completely different understanding of who's contributing and who's suffering as a result of climate change. And that has a really big impact on, for instance, how we might design policies which countries might expect to be compensated for reducing emissions and which countries might expect to be compensated for other countries that have not reduced their emissions. And 
we don't just have to look at this at the global scale and, and look at the, the levels. We can also look at things like the distributional effects of this. And so if we plot on a, on a straightforward Lorenz curve, for instance, uh, the production-based emissions, and that's what we're, I'm showing here. So these are the territorial emissions, the ones released within our economic borders uh, in the generation of, of output. We see that these are highly unequally distributed across countries. And that too has an implication for how countries present themselves as they come to international climate agreements. But if we were to take a look at the damaged based emissions and plot them on the same Lorenz curve, we find that they are even more unequally distributed. And so if we are trying to uh, make progress towards, for instance, SDG 10 to reduce uh, inequalities, and we are ignoring the damage-based account from climate emissions, then we are ignoring this difference. And the problem is that climate change is such a multi-dimensional challenge that we cannot possibly hope to address it effectively with unidimensional statistics. We need to look at this from every conceivable perspective. And so while I'm excited that the IMF is now working on consumption-based emissions as well as the production-based emissions, the next step, the next big innovation is to start producing and reporting damage-based carbon accounts for each country all around the world. And the reason that I think this is so important, if, if there's only one thing that you take away from, from my talk, it's that when it comes to accounting, perspective really matters. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. I think I'll give over to Adam, uh, who's going to be the discussant. Indeed, Matthew, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Oh and uh, right to time as well. Uh, Adam Dutton from the UK ONS is our discussant. Adam. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. I thought it was a really enjoyable paper. I had um, four thoughts when I read through it. I think the first was that it was a really useful read for any economist on some important aspects of uh, climate economics as they stand. It's an important additional core national climate metric with a uh, width of a uh, broad range of applications. And notably for this session it is to my mind, one of the most appropriate frameworks for adding climate into national accounting structures. But finally, I think there's a really fascinating and slightly darker subtext to this paper, which I hope is explored further. Um, I've never personally been a climate expert and uh, I would rec recommend it to other nine climate experts as a good primer in some of the pros and cons of the current approaches to costing macro climate impacts, uh, as should we all. And I think this is probably the wrong room to chastise for this, but uh, early in my career, I think uh, just as I was starting the uh, environmental masters, uh, environmental economics masters at UCL, I was told in no uh, uncertain terms that we were not a well-respected branch of the profession. This was confirmed when a student on the mainstream course referred to us all as hippies in a way that I was not entirely sure was just epic bants. And well, I have re reveled in that identity on the edge of the profession, if I'm honest. It's not as good looking uh, 2021 as it seems that colleague in 2003. And I'm really glad to see that's changing with environmental economic um, sessions in mainstream economic uh, conferences. Um, but with respect to the run through the climate cost models, it is really worrying that the preferred model is of past warming up to date, nothing towards uh, much higher levels of warning that were expected. Um, and properly accounting for future impacts is difficult, but something we aren't doing enough of now, and I think this underlines that, is actually monitoring how the co economic costs of climate change as we're seeing them now. Uh, are occurring. And I think there would be wider benefits if the approach that's highlighted in this paper stimulates more of that kind of work. Um, one thing that did, uh, did occur to me is that the paper is very economic in outlook. Um, and I would say that this means that the examination of the different basic carbon emissions measures may leaves out what I think is the key benefit of the production based metrics, which is that domestic control of production is where all the policy levers can be pulled. Um, I once worked as an economic advisor to a group of NGOs fighting aviation expansion and arguments like leakage would come up and I, I would occasionally be challenged that airport expansion is going ahead in Germany and Netherlands. And my response would be that I couldn't help it if the Dutch and German colleagues aren't making enough noise, but I'm here to talk to you and I'm campaigning against, if, unless I'm campaigning against train stations in Germany, my language skills would be a hindrance. The basic point being that while the theory might rightly stay, we just need to stick a carbon tax at the appropriate point, maybe that a border carbon tax or something uh, more domestic, 
Um, in practice, everything we filter through reality is that most of these decisions, very notably airport expansion, are heavily political in practice, which means that doing it actually at source is often the most appropriate point. And that's why uh, domestic production is the, you know, the, the dominant uh, measure. Not, not to say that this is an important um, perspective. And I think uh, Partha Dasgupta mentioned something very similar to this sort of process as being the appropriate way to incorporate the impacts of climate into national accounting. It does seem to be the basis of the climate uh, should enter national accounts. Um, sectoral analyses could be discussed, but this basic framework of a polluter exporting carbon to the atmosphere and in that in turn, exporting a cost uh, elsewhere is something that we can and should pursue. The paper goes on to suggest some constructive policy recommendations for how to respond to knowing where the harm is felt, largely through transfers of different kinds, such as uh, a reverse auction through the green climate fund, which could be weighted towards the share of their share of climate induced wealth depletions. But I think what isn't being said, uh, so regularly films, what I see is the bubbling subtext, which is who done it. If a set of accounts were developed on this basis, we can see who is exporting the harm but also the, the total cost of the harm it being exported from those countries. And that does raise a few other questions for me. Um, the paper notes the tendency of production-based accounts to flatter Western nations that farm out their needs for a polluting industry. But I do wonder if maybe uh, the, the way in which we would cost the total um, carbon pushed into the atmosphere would matter in that the marginal ton of, a carb, uh, of carbon emitted from Stevenson's rocket would be minuscule. As such, if we added all the total costs imposed on the world on that basis, we would still be flattering some nations with large historic emotions. So I'm equally unsure if it would make sense to constantly reassess the cost of the historic carbon. Um, what is correct, what is fair, could that influence the burden of balancing type payments? But beyond working out who does or doesn't owe who what, I think the paper also starts to running down a rabbit hole into which there is further to run. I think early on, Matt mentioned that some metrics conceal things. And I think if we start looking at costs, then I think there are a lot of things concealed within our current ways of estimating climate costs. Um, I mentioned the need to consider actually measuring climate impacts directly, not least because we can then pull apart primary and secondary impacts, as well as being able to spot where adaptation is masking impacts. The paper mentions the sustainability metrics of their approach, and I do agree uh, when we get into the detail. And I think Matt's already showed that the detail isn't there in terms of the data, and I think that's one of, one of the reasons we need to go further. Not least because a lot of the time climate costs are presented as averages, but they're experienced in extreme events. Um, when we bundle all climate costs up like this, local tragedies are smoothed out in a way that might hide growing catastrophes. If we start to measure and fully understand current impacts of climate change, where we can note where primary cost impacts such as crop losses are masked downstream by global supply chains. So as the numbers of these local tragedies at any one time increase, perhaps we can note early where rising numbers of failures are starting to overwhelm the market equivalent of the seawall and supply chains earlier in supply chains earlier rather than missing those signals. We can also help to note where primary impacts of climate change could be adapted to in some parts of the world and could be adapted to better with greater investment in other parts of the world and where existing adaptation work is starting to fail, creating vital sustainability metrics. And I think all of that is made possible by pursuing exactly this kind of cost-based approach, but we need to pursue it all the way down. Would be my thoughts on the paper. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Adam, and thank you, Matt, uh, for that uh, presentation. Uh, well, Adam mentioned that uh, environmental economics used to be seen as a kind of a fringe area uh, indulged in only by the eccentric few. Well, that was also the case for intangible assets, but fortunately that is now not the case. And we have some non-eccentric -ex non uh, pe people of the, of the many rather than the few um, to talk about this. Terra Alle is going to discuss the paper from um, McKinsey, uh, but before the paper is going to be given by Josh Martin uh, from from ONS. Over to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Josh Martin. I'm the head of the productivity team at the ONS, and it's great to be here talking about intangible capital. The, the title of my paper is, is Measuring the Other Half. Um, and the reason for that is that around half of all investment uh, in the UK business sector is in tangible assets, those traditional sorts of uh, assets. I can certainly try. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Is that better? Excellent. Sorry about that. OK, so around half of um, half of all investment in in the business sector in in the UK is in tangible assets uh, that those traditional sorts of assets um, like buildings and machinery and vehicles and computer hardware and so forth. And the other half is in intangible assets. Uh, that's what you can see on this graph here, which is current price expenditure in intangible in red and in intangible in blue. So those intangible assets are uh, things like research and development, software and, and databases, uh, and also branding and training and other similar types of uh, investments. Um, in fact, uh, over half of that is in intangible assets and that's been true since the early 2000s. Now that's only true if you go beyond what's in the national accounts. This light blue line is the, the sum of the intangible assets that you get if you only looked at the official national accounts which are governed by international standards held by the United Nations and by Eurostat. Um, and the, the, the contribution of, the, of this paper and indeed this, this whole agenda of work, which started uh, some years ago and, and, and Jonathan has been a, a key proponent in it uh, for, for a long time, is to think about these additional types of intangible assets and, and how we can measure those and what they add to the story. Um, the ONS published uh, experimental estimates of intangible investment just last week, uh, updating these numbers uh, to 2018. Um, and in, in doing so, have published for the first time constant price estimates, which means we're controlling for changes in prices over time. This means we can really see uh, the growth pattern of these uh, investments much better. And what you can see here, uh, very interestingly, is that during the economic downturn in 2008 9, uh, tangible investment uh, fell very sharply, about 30 percentage points over the course of two years, whereas intangible investment was much more resilient and, and fell much less and much more slowly. Um, tangible investment then recovered, but it does suggest that either in the way we measure it or in the way that businesses invest in it, um, uh, intangible investment and tangibles are, are different and intangibles are in some way more uh, persistent and, and more uh, continuous in their, in their investments. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the framework and, and, and what's in here and how we measure it before I get back into some more results. So a lot of this work dates back uh, to the early 2000s and work by Carol Corrado, Chuck Holton and Dan Sickle in the US. And this framework is from their seminal paper in 2005. And we can think about intangibles in, in three main categories. There's computerized in information, which essentially captures software and databases. Uh, this is captured as an asset in the national accounts. Um, I should clarify here that this doesn't capture the value of the data in the databases. Um, it's only the value of the databases themselves, net of the data. Uh, there is discussions at the international level about cap capitalizing the value of data, although that uh, turns out to be very difficult to do. Then there's a whole bunch of things that, that are sort of innovative. Um, research and development is the, is the most widely known, um, and that is treated as capital in the national account since changes uh, around 2010. Uh, there's also mineral exploration, which is essentially surveying for oil and other sorts of mineral deposits, and entertainment, literary and artistic originals, which are essentially copyright assets like music, uh, books and films. Both of those are also treated as, as investments and assets in the national accounts. But there are other types of uh, uh, capital spending, spending by businesses, investments um, that aren't treated as capital in the national accounts. Uh, those being product and process design and some types of product innovation that you might find in the financial services uh, sector that isn't well captured in R&D. And then there's a whole bunch of things that we call economic competencies, which are sort of softer uh, intangibles, uh, branding, organizational capital, firm specific human capital, clearly spending by business that generates future benefits uh, at the expense of current uh, expenditure, um, but they are not treated as uh, investment in the national accounting frameworks. So uh, how do we measure all of these? Well, for those that are in the national accounts, we defer to those measures. Um, they follow international guidance and we don't try in this paper or in the experimental work by the ONS to, uh, to, to change those. For those that are not treated as capital in the national accounts, we can, we can look at three main groups. Firstly, for, for what I call purchased investment, that is spending by businesses that is a transaction in the national in the economy. It is a real 
uh, transaction between businesses, a business that produces a, a type of asset and a business that buys it, that would be captured in, in GDP and in the national accounts to some degree, but it's currently treated as current expenditure. It's therefore netted off when we calculate gross value added. So we would think about reclassifying some fraction of that to be capital spending instead and use national account sources to do that. Then there's a whole bunch of things that we call own account investment, which is essentially businesses generating an asset that they're gonna use themselves. They're not gonna transact it on the market. They're not gonna buy it. They're not gonna sell it. They're gonna build it themselves and then use it and keep it in subsequent years. Um, because it's not transacted, it's very difficult to ask a business about this. So we model it by the sum of uh, the costs that it takes to create it. And we do that by identifying relevant occupations. Uh, so for, uh, for, for estimates of own account software investment, the sorts of people who, generate, who create software in-house in businesses we can use data from the annual earning uh, annual survey of hours and earnings to do that uh, alongside other adjustments to convert to market prices and then for uh, for training uh, this is largely the opportunity cost for both the trainer and the trainee uh, of of participating and giving that training so we use a data from a specialist survey the employer skills survey uh, run by the department for education um, which uh, captures some data on uh, the hours spent training and train and receiving training and the cost of those uh, those exercises. Um, in the experimental estimates published last week, which are the, the third set of such estimates published by the ONS over the last couple of years, uh, we made a few developments in the, the methods. Um, this builds on a long uh, and rich history of, uh, of measurement in this area, uh, led by uh, Jonathan and, and co-authors previously in the UK and, and many others around the world. Uh, the ONS is, is involved in trying to improve these measures further, and these are just some of the things that we uh, incorporated in the latest set of estimates. I won't go into uh, into all of them, uh, but there are more details uh, on, on, on the website and, and in accompanying papers. As I said before, we also um, incorporated for the first time uh, constant price estimates, which means we needed uh, price indices or deflators to be able to convert uh, current price spending to constant price or real investment. Um, again, for, the, for those assets that are treated as assets in the national accounts, we defer to those sources. Uh, but for those outside uh, outside the capital boundary in the national accounts, we developed a few new methods. Uh, for, for purchased investments, we rely on services producer price indices uh, where they exist. Uh, we, we conducted a review and found that the contents of those was largely consistent with what we wanted to capture. Um, for own, own account investment, not only can we measure the, the wages of, uh, of the workers involved in these things, the, the software creators in businesses, for instance, we can also look at their hours worked as a, as a volume indicator, and construct a, a deflator that way. And for training, since the, the majority of the cost is the opportunity cost of, uh, of, of being trained and deliver, li delivering training, those, those labour costs, uh, we can deflate that expenditure by the index of labour costs per hour. Now, why do we care about all of this? I mean, measurement is, is, is always important and good, but uh, ultimately, uh, what is this all about? Well, relating indeed to the, to the title of this session and, and the people who helped to put together this session, one of the main reasons that we're interested in, in intangible assets is productivity. Capital, uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell uh, everyone in the audience, is a crucial part of the production function. Um, and it's clear that that capital should not just be uh, the things that, that we currently measure, but in fact anything uh, that contributes to improving future resources at the expense of current resources is an investment on the part of a business and we need to incorporate all of those things. Um, a wide variety of studies have now found a link between intangible investment and productivity across sectors and across countries. It's just a couple of examples noted there, but there are many, many more. Um, and increasingly intangible capital is captured in growth accounting exercises uh, in countries, in studies and, and internationally. I was really pleased to see recently that the, the EU CLEMS project uh, has an analytical module that incorporates these experimental estimates of intangible investment from, from international projects uh, into their growth accounting exercises as well. So these are important uh, factors to, to incorporate, to better understand growth and better understand productivity. 
now changing the way that we treat them, uh, treat this type of spending doesn't solve the productivity puzzle. Um, that's, uh, that's, that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't do it. It still helps uh, and improves our understanding, but it doesn't mean that uh, the productivity puzzle is gonna go away um, if we suddenly account for these things better. So one, uh, speaking of, of the productivity puzzle, one, one interesting finding out of these new set of data that were published last week, uh, the chart shows uh, constant price spending, real spending, the real volume of investment in training. And this is uh, firm specific uh, human capital training. Um, and you can see that up until the, uh, the economic downturn in sort of 2008-9, there was quite a, a sort of persistently high volume of training going on in the UK market sector. And really since then, uh, it, it, it's fallen and stayed low. Um, this could uh, be related to, uh, to the productivity puzzle, um, a, a sort of quarter, quarter drop in, uh, in the volume of training going on uh, and, and, and coinciding quite so neatly with, with the economic downturn is quite an interesting finding. And it's particularly interesting in light of the sort of perceived wisdom on the, the causes of the productivity puzzle. This is from the ONS's quarterly multi-factor productivity estimates. Um, and uh, although the, the, the colors may be a little bit difficult to distinguish, but what it shows um, is that since the, the economic downturn in 2008-9, improvements in labor composition have helped to prop up labor productivity growth. Labor composition is typically measured by um, hours worked of different types of, types of people in, in the workforce, namely uh, looking at differences in qualifications. And it shows that, that higher educated, better educated people are, are making up an increasingly large fraction of the workforce. That may well be true, but it could also be true that those people don't have the skills necessary to work in the modern economy, or indeed the older workers uh, don't have the skills necessary. And if the level of training has fallen, then that could uh, drive down MFP and could help to explain the, the lower levels of MFP in this chart. So much more to do in this space, but it is uh, it shows you some of the insights that we could gain from from looking into these data in a bit more detail. Now, there's there's a wide variety of um, these sort of intangible investment activities across sectors, um, starting just with with some more traditional measures. This is R and D, um, and and this is constant price estimates per million workers. So this is sort of relative to the size of the industry. How much R and D investment is there going on? in each industry over time. I've got production industries on the left and services industries on the right. Now, don't worry about trying to make out the different lines for the different industries, uh, probably quite small on your screen. But um, what you might be able to notice is that there's one line above all the rest on the left, which is manufacturing. And on the right, there are two lines which are above the, the dotted average for the market sector. And those are the professional and scientific uh, activities industry, uh, which is where the, R the specialist R&D industry falls, um, and also the ICT industry. So, you know, if you just look at R&D, you get a picture of manufacturing being very uh, innovative, the most innovative sector in the economy, and, and, and few others coming close. If we expand to all those other sorts of intangible assets in the national accounts, which mainly in involves adding in software, then we get a slightly different picture. Um, the ICT industry really pulls away on the right hand side and the financial services industry comes up to join it above, uh, above the average. We also have some of the utilities industries apparently becoming uh, much more innovative. This is largely because they, uh, they are very capital intensive relative to the number of workers they have. If we expand again to the broader set of intangibles that are in this paper, we get a different picture again. Um, with financial services now really leading the way on the right hand side in the light blue. So it just goes to show how differences in measurement really do change our perspective. Looking at R&D alone isn't sufficient um, and looking at this broader set really does help to tell the picture, tell the story. So I'll, I'll finish just by saying where we're going next with intangibles. Uh, there's, there's more work to be done. This is still a, a relatively immature area, al although it has benefited from, from a lot of work from a lot of authors over many years. Um, I think there's a need to harmonize and, and firm up some of our definitions. Uh, there are, uh, you know, these aren't, aren't governed by international standards like the rest of the national accounts are. So for consistency amongst researchers and, and to assure, ensure no double counting between um, uh, categories of intangible investment, it would be useful uh, 
to do that and I think that's that's an area that the ONS can um, can contribute to there's obviously a need to sort of further develop our, our, our measurements as as always and also reconcile sources um, some some survey sources with some macro sources which is generally what I've shown you today they don't always tell us the same thing there's a need to research appropriate asset lives and depreciation rates to estimate capital stocks and capital services and integrate into a growth accounting framework and so forth that's been done in the past, but the ONS is, 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 is doing something similar now and trying to uh, ensure those are robust, as robust as they can be. And this is all part of a wider program at the ONS, some of which you're hearing about today um, on, on a range of measures of capital, uh, social capital, human capital, natural capital are all part of that as well, with a view to build up a better picture of a, a sort of total set of capitals across the economy and all in the spirit of the beyond GDP agenda. Uh, going beyond the core national accounts and, and the core measures to get a better perspective of, of the economy and of welfare more generally. So I shall finish there. Thank you very much. Uh, do feel free to get in touch if you'd like to hear more. And thank you. Josh, that's terrific. Uh, and our discussant is Tara Alley, And I'm particularly pleased that Tara is discussing because this is not just national accountants talking to other national accountants. Uh, Tara is from the private sector. She's from McKinsey. Um, so very, very happy to welcome you, Tara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan and, and Josh, um, not just for your contributions today, but obviously for the huge contributions you are making and have made over the decades and certainly years in this area. Um, as Josh said, it is a little bit in its nascency, but it, you know, there's clearly significant progress being made. Um, and I'm also very relieved to hear from Jonathan that it is now entering the mainstream and I no longer need to think of myself as a geek. Um, just because I'm really interested in these topics. Um, I'm Tara Alice, I'm Director of Research and Economics at McKinsey, and as Jonathan has mentioned, at McKinsey, and in particular at the McKinsey Global Institute, we do look at issues uh, to do with productivity and growth a lot. And of course, you cannot really look at those issues without also looking at technology and without looking at uh, intangibles investment. So it all comes together in understanding kind of the modern economy and the modern business um, to, to also pay attention to these slightly less tangible types of assets. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I'm delighted to offer a couple of uh, reflections, which I'll structure into three topics or areas. First of all, just share with you my thoughts on the importance of measuring and understanding intangibles. Um, secondly, um, reflect a little bit on the progress that is being made on the measurement of intangibles. And then thirdly, um, I'll share a few thoughts in terms of the research agenda going forward and the sorts of questions that I think uh, we should be focused on at a minimum. Of course, there's a broad research agenda in general, but there are a couple of things that I personally find particularly intriguing. So starting off with the importance of intangibles, Josh has already done a really good job of explaining this, um, but I wanted to highlight it a little bit further. So we've all heard a million times already that most Western economies are now service-based economies. You hear the statistic that 80% of our GDP comes from services repeated quite frequently, but you do not hear um, the 50% statistic are repeated nearly as frequently, 50% of all the investment that's going on from the business side into the economy is in fact already intangible. So instead of you know, the more traditional things that we think of when we think about capital investment like buildings or cars and vans and transport vehicles or machinery or hardware, computer hardware, we are really talking here about much more intangible things, but equally important for business profitability, business success, business growth and business resilience, things like training, organizational capital, brand, um, and indeed the sorts of things that are luckily already in the national accounts, but continue to be important, such as R&D and software investments. Now, um, the two factors I've mentioned, the service-led um, economy and these intangibles are obviously not, in, in, not interconnected, so they are interconnected. Um, if you look at the UK and um, where our comparative advantages lie internationally, and also the sectors that have been growing the fastest, um, they tend to be in the knowledge-based services, um, in particular financial services, professional services, um, 
but um, and, and a couple of very R&D intensive or sort of knowledge intensive manufacturing sectors, such as pharmaceuticals and aerospace. And it is indeed in those areas that, you know, that already make up 25% or a quarter of the UK's GDP. Um, and then there are a large set of more consumer facing, perhaps slightly less high value added, but nevertheless important sectors like retail, like food manufacturing, where a lot of these more intangible factors such as brand investment, market research, customer relationships, um, and indeed training of your employees um, and investment in digital channels are increasingly important uh, for competitive advantage of those businesses. So all in all, um, we can't really understand the economy unless we understand these um, intangible assets better. So what progress has been made on the measurement? Well, it's very encouraging, I would say. The fact that the ONS is taking very seriously, the fact that there are um, you know, um, academics like Jonathan and uh, Carol, who have been pushing the agenda for a long time. The fact that EU claims is taking up um, uh, a module around this means that there will be more information, more practice, more opportunities to hone the approaches. Um, and, you know, it's really moving into the mainstream of uh, not just kind of academics, but also in how we think about it being incorporated into national statistics. And so that's really important and valuable in, in just making sure that the data we all look at on a daily basis uh, reflects the reality of the businesses that are out there um, getting on with their, with their business. Um, I'm also pleased to see that the uh, ONS and others are using quite some creative methods and I thought the use of occupations, for example, to get a better handle on which organizations and which sectors are investing how much in things like brand and marketing or organizational capital is, is quite a useful way of um, reconciling the data from uh, different sources, including from various different surveys, because inevitably when you're doing this kind of work, you're sort of pushing the boundaries of what data is out there and you're having to make a bunch of estimates and triangulations. And it sounds to me like the availability of data is improving the whole time and those triangulations are becoming richer and better at really honing in on what the numbers should look like, but they're still quite uh, assumption based. And I think the, the thing that I would say on that front is that the most important thing that can happen to these statistics is that people start using them. Because as soon as you start using them, you realize that maybe some of the data isn't quite what it needs to be. And especially if businesses start using them, they will recognize or not recognize themselves in the statistics. And that kind of feedback will allow uh, statistical agencies as well as academics to further improve the methodologies and the estimates. So just two examples on that front. First of all, um, around training investment, I've been looking at this for various different countries by sector and so on. And I'm very puzzled by the German estimates for training investment, which are very low in the intangibles assets type of measurements, whereas they're much higher in other kinds of data sets. And I think the most likely explanation for this is just what gets capitalized is different in different countries. And so those kinds of issues do need to get sorted out for us to use this data properly. Another one is the way we think about R&D, um, which of course currently doesn't seem to include any R&D in the financial sector. And I know that gets picked up in the non-capitalized um, intangibles, but R&D in the financial sector is a really critical driver of fintech, um, of all kinds of new product innovation, and indeed the kind of efficiency and effectiveness of various different data um, methodologies and data analytics that get used. So, you know, that needs to come into the fold for us to fully understand the economy. So what do I have to say about the agenda going forward? Well, the first thing to say is that even with incomplete data, we are already making progress. And it, that may sound like um, a controversial statement um, at the Royal Economic Society conference, but it's only, um, as I said, when we start using the data that we can hone it, but also really critical for starting to change people's mental models about how the economy works. Like it or not, the way that the national accounts are produced impacts the way that people think about the drivers of economic growth, even though 
in some ways, they're just the mathematical drivers of where the data came from. But in many people's minds, they're also the conceptual drivers. And unless we incorporate intangibles in that mental model, we're probably going to be making the wrong kinds of predictions and policy uh, prescriptions um, around uh, all kinds of things to do with growth and employment and productivity and so on. The second key area for uh, further research, I think, is that link between productivity and growth um, and these different types of capitals. And here we probably need to use more micro data rather than just national accounts data uh, in order to get to the bottom of what's going on. Uh, it's quite challenging because there are a lot of non-linearities. For example, for training investment, there's probably more like an optimum level rather than something where you just see diminishing returns. Um, a lot of these are complementary, so if you invest in hardware, you also want to invest in software and data analytics. Um, there are clear complementarities between R&D and organizational capital and training and all those kinds of things. So looking at those non-linearities and complementarities, I think, will be important so that, again, the policy implications we draw out of these kinds of assessments are in the right direction. And then finally, I think it's time for us to start thinking about how we unify, not maybe a unifying theory, but a unifying practice around how we account for wealth, as we've been discussing today. Um, it's, it's going to be challenging, but it's very much worthwhile, in my opinion, because as we are discussing today, a lot of the stuff that we really care about, whether good or bad, is missing from the way that we look at the economy as a whole. Um, and um, I think there are a lot of opportunities now with this better data to start thinking about how do we look at both at the international, national and business level at what the assets really are that will generate profits and output and employment in the future. So bottom line, uh, loads and loads of great progress, lots and lots of more work to do, but a really exciting agenda and a really important agenda for us to take forward. Thank you. Tara, thanks very much. That's that's terrific. Um, we're going to move to the final paper now. Um, just before Mary does that, uh, let me say to the audience that uh, we're going to have a panel at the end where I'm going to ask the um, authors uh, to have a bit of a roundtable discussion, respond to some of the questions which have come in. We've got one question that's come in. Uh, Tara's raised this very interesting question about how we go about this type of research when these things are very uncertain. I think that's an issue uh, which the panel might, might like to take up um, as well. But can I encourage you, if you've got more questions, to please send them in uh, and, uh, and indeed vote for uh, uh, any questions uh, which come up. Um, thank you, Mary, for your patience. Uh, we're going to pass over to Mary uh, uh, O'Mahony from King's College in ESCO uh, to talk about education. Mary. I needed to unmute. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Jonathan. Um, so this, this particular paper is looking at, at, at a form of, um, I'll just put this back to Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at a particular, I'll go, I'll go back up to the, the first slide, um, missing, missing intangible asset. Um, and this is um, human capital, and, and in particular, the education produced, um, the knowledge produced by the education sector. So in this paper, which is joined with Carol Carrado at the conference board and Leo Samak at OECD and, and ESCO, um, we are, um, what, what I'm going to do here is just try and sketch out a kind of a framework for looking at education as an intangible asset that could be incorporated within the national accounts. So it's all within a, a national accounts framework. So I'll do this very quickly. I've only got 15 minutes and it's quite a complicated uh, framework, but um, I'll, I'll try to, to bring you through the ideas here. Um, and then what, what we've been doing um, more recently is we've been looking at um, how this impacts on productivity. And in particular, is there some role for this um, way of, of incorporating education to explain some of the, um, the productivity slowdown? So. Um, so as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go through um, a, a few equations, just a, a general sketch of the framework. So what we think of here is that education as a social infrastructure. And uh, the idea is that the education sector produces knowledge and that knowledge is, um, is held is as inventory within the school system. So um, the knowledge is there, uh, it's, it's generated every year by the education sector and then um, at the end of, of the year, and um, some people graduate or some people uh, drop out of the, of the school system. But um, 
it, it, it's this, this idea of an inventory that should be included in, 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 in the national accounting. Right, so we have each school's year starts with a beginning stock of, of knowledge uh, assets and then concludes with a terminal stock and, and, the, and the production of education is a difference between the, um, the terminal stock of, of, uh, of knowledge and the beginning stock of knowledge. Um, so um, basically I put this here on this equation and uh, we have to take account of uh, dropouts and we also have to take account that some people will actually graduate from the education system and then they become part of the productive workforce and their human capital is taken into account in the usual way through the human capital estimates we have in the nat uh, national accounts or through the labor composition estimates we do in, in the productivity calculations. And then there are some people who come into the education system within, within a year who have uh, previously been out of the education system and then comes in. So the terminal stock then is the knowledge produced and acquired uh, via migration into the education system plus the, uh, the knowledge inventories from the previous period. So this is an idea of, of, of we have an in, uh, output of the education sector as a difference between the terminal and the beginning period stocks. And then we can, um, we can depict this in terms of, uh, of a production function where the output of the, the, the real output of the education sector depends on the labor used in the education sector, on the, on the capital, uh, equipment, uh, computers, all, all that kind of stuff, and also the knowledge stock that is already that is in 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 the education system, and uh, so we have a, a, a production function, then a, pay, a payments, the factor inputs e, uh, as well, and then what we do is we estimate um, in in terms of estimating the uh, productivity impacts of looking at this this way of of looking at um, including education as an intangible asset. Then we, we estimate an augmented production function uh, where we have these knowledge stocks as an additional um, type of asset here. In, in. And then we compare this to what's in the national accounts now where this additional type of asset, uh, intangible asset is not taken into account. And we use the usual um, divisi indexes to, um, uh, to, 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 to estimate this. Okay, so just um, to give a, a very um, brief overview of what we're actually doing in this kind of calculation. So um, we're using the um, jorgensen um model of lifetime income uh, measure of human capital stocks as a kind of base for our, our calculations. So this just says that the lifetime income of, of a person of sex S, AJ, and education level uh, E at any time depends on their current income, plus um, the lifetime earnings of someone who is one is aged one year older, and that has to be adjusted to um, take account of a probability of, of survival, discounted, and also to take account of the fact that if someone, uh, if the lifetime earnings were for a, one year later, then there would be some growth in nominal earnings during that period. So this is um, a, a very standard model that's used by um, national statistical offices everywhere. Um, this formula is, is, is a very simple version of this. If you, if you um, it, the formula becomes more complicated if you take account of younger age groups because some of those might change their education levels. But the idea is that you accumulate the, the income uh, uh, over the lifetime of a person, and that gives you a measure of the, of the uh, lifetime incomes that arise um, from various education levels. So then um, the, the model that's used here, and it's, it's been used not just by us, but by others too, um, uh, Barbara Farmani for the US and Wulong Gu for in Statistics Canada, is to say that the, the value, the nominal value of the output of the ed education sector is the enrollments multiplied by the lifetime earnings um, of someone who is, if we think of uh, education as, as in terms of years of education, then it will be someone who has one extra year of education, but is also one year older. So you take the, the lifetime earnings of, of that person minus uh, the lifetime earnings of someone who is, um, age A and has a, a lower education level, age E, and then multiply that by the enrollments in each education level. And that gives you a value of the output of the, of, of the education sector. And then we can just value the, um, the beginning period stocks as the enrollments times the lifetime earnings of, of, of those individuals. And then we can also define quantity measures. So these were, these were value measures, the value of the output of the education sector. Um, and these uh, we can define quantity measures as uh, the, the change in the enrollments um, share weighted. And the shares come from these value measures in, in the previous slide. So we have a value of, of the output of the education sector. Um, 
and we also have a value of stocks of knowledge within the education sector, and then we have quantity measures, and be, uh, then we can take the ratio of the two to give us prices. So it's a, it's a, a, a you know, it works within a kind of a consistent uh, framework um, standard in national accounting. Okay, so um, that, that's very, very, very brief um, sketch of what we're trying to do here. <laughs> um, but so, but in terms of implementation, there's a, there's a number of things that need to uh, be taken into account. And here, I just want to mention a, a few. Um, the first is this issue of attribution, and this is really distinguishes our work from those work done by others for the US and Canada. In that, um, we're looking at um, the knowledge produced by the education sector, and we want to net out any knowledge. Um, in, incorporated in, in the human capital of individuals that come after they leave education through experience, um, through training, through uh, any of the things that, that Im impact on human capital um, other than education. So um, we have been working for some time on this. We've used a number of different ways of doing this. We can use a kind of a standard min mincer adjustment for attribution, or we could just, uh, we've also experimented with using earnings um, some two, two years after graduation as the, the, uh, the earnings and anything beyond that is, 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 comes from experience, from uh, uh, on-the-job training, et cetera. Um, so so um, in, the, in the numbers I'm showing here, they're based on the Mincer adjustment, but I should say we, we, we are working on, on um, some robustness around this. The, probably the most difficult thing to take into account is um, we want to have increments to um, lifetime earnings but when you look at um, the vast majority of numbers of people in the education system are actually those aged between four and 16 up to the compulsory uh, leaving age. And um, what we need to do here is decide, well, what do we compare those people? So when you, when you go beyond the compulsory age, uh, just, uh, age, you can compare, say, degrees with lower levels of qualifications. And what do you do when uh, comparing those people? Because they're not actually able to work. And so you can't observe their, their earnings. And what we, we, we um, do here is, we, again, we've tried a lot of variants, um, but it, what makes sense is to think of, um, assuming that those with no education would still be productive uh, and still uh, earn some lifetime incomes, and therefore we, we compare with the minimum wage. Now, the, again, the previous uh, work in this area has not taken account of this. They, they just assume that all lifetime earnings come from education. So someone who had no education would earn nothing. And we think this is, not, this is not a particularly realistic assumption. This is important. And it, as it turns out, um, results um, do vary a lot depending on what your baseline comparison is in this, in this part. Um, the third thing is just education transition. So you want lifetime earnings of one level relative to a, a lower level. But what is the lower level? Well, um, in, in the case of the UK, we um, we assume that we can compare A levels with GCSE uh, and then further education colleges with GCSE rather than A levels. There's a lot of people uh, will go straight, go from a GCSE into a further college rather than to the A levels. But we, we've um, experimented a little bit with um, having for older age groups comparing with A levels and then we compare higher education with A levels. And this is, um, again, you know, we can make various assumptions here and, and the results can be uh, change a little depending on the, uh, the transitions, but I'll come back in the conclusion to um, this is very important when you start looking at another country um, we're looking at now, which is the US. And the final part of this, which I think is quite, again, is quite a radical change from what's been done in the past, is that we're thinking of education as social infrastructure available uh, in the economy for future use. Um, and some part of that ser um, education services actually is not available to domestic economies. It is international students, uh, and they should be treated as exports. And in the in the, in the national accounts, um, you know, the uh, education services to foreign students are treated as exports. So, um, so we have, uh, as we all know, those of us working in the university sector, that the number of uh, international students has been has been increasing very rapidly. It was about 5% of uh, total HE enrollments in the, in the early 90s and has gone up to about 15% now. So um, there's, there's been a big increase in this. And what we, we, we uh, suggest here is that what you should do here is use the tuition fees to value the outputs rather than the increments to lifetime, UK lifetime earnings uh, for this part of, of the education. So you separate out the export part from the domestic production. Um, 
How much time have I got? Uh, I don't want to take up too much time. We're using very standard sources of information from um, uh, Labour Force Survey enrolments from the Department of Education, PESA data, uh, survival probabilities, etc. And we use the on the on the on the uh, input side. We've been using um, data from EU CLAMS. So if we look at um, what we're looking at here, number of enrolments, um, and and the scales are different on the two axes. So the largest uh, number of, of people in the education se sector by far are those in school. And we see that that has uh, decreased a little um, in the mid uh, early 2000s to about 2010, starts to increase a little bit uh, subsequently. And that that's um, this, this increase has a lot to do with the, um, the fact that we had a lot of mi uh, migration into the UK economy, um, into the UK in the early 2000s. And, and those people were quite young people and they've stayed and have families and their average family size tends to be a bit higher than the uh, domestic uh, population. So you're getting a little bit of an increase, but it's fairly flat. Uh, higher education has increased a lot, but most of that increase comes from, from foreign students and, and, and not so much from domestic students. So then I'd just like to uh, present a couple of slides of what, um, what this actually means in practice. So um, what we have here is an index of real, uh, uh, UK education output, um, and you'll see that the uh, when we do this, uh, the new measure of education output, which is based on out, uh, outcomes rather than the existing national accounts estimates, which are based on the cost of providing the education, we have uh, an increase in uh, uh, in the growth of um, of education output. Now, what um, is important here in terms of taking account of this kind of um, way of looking at uh, education as an intangible asset is that um, the nominal payments, the nominal values are much larger in, uh, in or measure relative to what's currently in the national accounts. And for the UK, this calculation adds approximately 9% to aggregate nominal GDP. So that's, that's big. That's a bit, it's big, but the original estimates by Jorgensen, Farmani and, 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 uh, and others doubled GDP and in some cases trebled GDP. And it's one reason why this kind of approach was never really looked at, at in the past was, well, we're not going to, we're not going to double GDP by bringing in human capital. But this way of looking at it, it's a, it's a big hike to GDP. It's not outlandishly big. Um, so um, if this was ever taken up. And then if, if we do our, we have, the numbers I'm presenting here are unadjusted numbers. If we adjust for foreign students, if we include dropouts, absenteeism, the numbers go down uh, a bit. Then what happens if we look at um, how this impacts on, on TFP? So the first thing I'm showing here is the index of TFP in the education sector. And as you'll see, with the, um, uh, the original, what's in the national accounts at the moment, TFP um, has, been, has been falling steadily um, throughout the period under consideration here. Now, I should mention here that this is the, the numbers in the national accounts that has no quality adjustments in, in the education output figures in, in the national accounts at, at present. Uh, ONS, are, of course, are working on, on, on including quality adjustments in education output, which given that we're no longer part of um, the ESA, it might, might well appear in, in the national accounts at some stage in the future. But those quality adjustments can also be incorporated in, in, within our framework. And in fact, one of them absenteeism, we, we, we have estimates that can do, do that. But you can see that TFP growth in the education sector in, in, with our new estimates is, is, is pretty flat. Whereas in the past, um, in, in, the, in the current national accounts estimates, it's falling rapidly. Um, and then we, we asked, well, what we do if we, um, if we include this uh, way of thinking into the aggregate economy TFP? And you see that it, ha it, has, a, it has an impact, uh, it's relatively small, but still um, it's, it, 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 you know, it's sig significant. So what we have is that, um, in the period up to 2007, up to the financial crisis, the, our adjusted measure has lower TFP growth than um, uh, in, in existing national accounts. And the reason for this is there's two counteracting uh, things going on here. One is that we are replacing the current education estimates with something where the TFP growth is, is higher, as I've shown in the last slide. But we're also giving a, a much greater weight now to the education sector within the national accounts. And the education sector in the past, at least, had uh, typically had lower TFP growth than other sectors in the economy, and that dampens the TFP growth. And then if you look at the period um, from uh, 2007 to 2018, there's very little difference between the uh, 
original estimates and our adjusted estimates. Now that's, so you could say the, the, the productivity slowdown is less when you adjust for this measure of human capital, but that's not a very positive way of looking at things. It's, quite, it's negative in a way. It's saying the rest of the economy and coming down to the kind of TFP growth rates you get in the education sector rather than uh, necessarily explaining the, the slowdown. But it does, it does have a, 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 a slight impact on the aggregate uh, uh, TFP growth rates. Um, so I don't want to spend much more time. So that's just a summary of the results and just a little bit about um, what we're doing um, going forward. So um, we, we're very much um, involved now in trying to produce estimates for the US because we think a comparison between the UK and the US would really give a lot of insight uh, into the drivers uh, and the, you know, the, 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 the interactions actions between the school systems and, and uh, uh, how, how that impacts on productivity. Uh, and we're, but we're a bit stuck because, um, as I mentioned earlier, when you, you can make various assumptions about education transitions when you want to get the lifetime earnings, these, these increments to lifetime earnings. In the, U, in the UK, it's fairly linear, it's fairly straightforward. In the US, it's very complicated because uh, people can um, go into various levels of education through different routes. So they can go directly from high school to four year program, they can go to a two-year program and then to a four-year program. They can go into a community college and then to a two-year and then to a four-year or a community college to a four-year. And it all kind of gets, gets quite complicated. So we're, we're, we're working on various um, assumptions here, uh, but we, we do hope to have some estimates fairly soon. And I think that that comparison between the two countries would be very interesting. And then uh, another thing to, to mention here is that, you know, if this was ever taken up we, by, by, uh, and, and put into the national accounts, um, what we're doing, is we're essentially replacing what's in the national accounts education estimates at the moment by our measures, but some parts of that national education sector are, are not directly related to education. And for example, in the HE sector uh, produces research and also hospitality services are quite big in the HE sector. And there's other parts of the uh, education sector, for example, English language training, which we don't actually take into account in this measure. So there has to be some more adjustments to what we take out um, and put some of it back in, uh, in order to, uh, to get a, you know, a measure that's, that's com uh, completely consistent and robust. But um, we think that all, all of this is doable and you have to start somewhere. So um, I feel that what, what we're trying to do here is a, at least a start and looking in the right direction. And that has Thank, to be finished. <laughs> thanks very much, Mary. T terrific, important part of missing capital. Uh, Andy Dickerson from Sheffield is our discussant. Mary, if you thanks. could stop sharing your screen, oh, yeah, sorry. I think that'd be helpful. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and thank you, Mary, for that presentation of, of what is a complex paper. So for a few minutes, I thought that was, uh, that was very impressive. Um, let me start by making an observation about uh, why I think we're here, and, and, and that is that the historical bias towards measuring tangibles rather than intangibles really stems from the historical legacy of why we established systems of national accounts in the first place. And, and that, I suppose, failure to recognize the transition into the post-industrialized world, especially in developed economies, um, the point that made by Terra that, 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 you know, essentially services now dominate and counting widgets is no longer the, the, the name of the game for us, means that our, our national accounts really fail to reflect what I suspect many people understand or think they understand by what we mean by GDP. And, and, and that's a big problem. And, and so, you know, I really welcome this session as an attempt to start to get people to perhaps uh, uh, understand a little better about what GDP is and what it isn't in the systems of national accounts that we currently orchestrate. Um, as Mike Grins just said in his AEA presidential address, our understanding of what is happening our, in our economy is constrained by the extent and quality of the available data. And I think nowhere is that better said than when we're trying to measure the productive potential of our economy. And so you know, the measurement of intangibles in an appropriate way and incorporating those into systems of national accounts, I think is, is a really important issue. And in a world increasingly dominated by the use of, indeed, misuse of knowledge and information, a focus on the contribution of education as an investment in knowledge-based capital and thereby productive potential is particularly welcomed, even if that incorporation into um, official statistics, so an S and R and so on, and, and, and comparable international data is probably still some time away, I think it would be, it would be fair to say. Um, 
it's important, I think, in particular, if it helps us better understand what is help it, what is happening to productivity both within and indeed between countries. And, and I think the the root the root understanding of that lies somewhere in our understanding of what's happening to intangible investments such as in education. So the pair of paper by Mary and her co-authors calculates this social intangible investment in education. Um, uh, two elements, the accumulation of knowledge assets through the school system, and then if you like, the exploitation of that knowledge assets in terms of the accrued lifetime income as a result of those individuals once they hit the labor market, once they reach the labor market. I had three thoughts, and uh, I think I've got a minute for each of these as I read the paper and listened to Mary, Mary's presentation, which I think highlight the importance of this analysis um, and, and raise three questions for me at the same time. So the first one is, is about education participation. In the UK, we're probably at the end of the expansion of HE participation. 50%, we've hit the 50% education, education, education target of Tony Blair. It's unlikely to go any higher, I think, for both political and economic reasons. Uh, um, we're at, uh, I suppose, uh, the share which will be maximized. And so if we are going to um, achieve any further growth in our productive potential from, uh, from schooling, certainly, then it's the utilization of that asset, if you like, that has got to be better then um, we can't grow the asset further. I think that, that's what I'm trying to say here. Utilization of that education investment where the future returns to that factor of production will come from. So we need to understand better, I suppose, for example, the fact that higher education in the UK has a, has a big gender gap. There's a 60, 60, 40, well, 55, 45, 10 percentage point difference in the gender distribution of participants in higher education. And perhaps you know, one of the reasons why we don't perhaps see as much return there is the underutilization of some of that productive asset or indeed the underpayment of some of that productive assets um, in particular. Uh, so glass ceilings, um, sticky floors and so on perhaps means that we don't get as much return from that asset as, as we could do. The second thing on participation is the other 50%, 50% who don't go into HG. And, and Mary mentioned those. Um, there's more heterogeneity here than perhaps um, is, is evident in the paper, I think, so far. And that is that there are the, the complexity of routes through the further education sector is, is quite large. Um, some, some of those are repeating the same level of education that they fail to achieve in the schooling system. And we know that the returns to just getting a C or not getting a C at GCSE, for example, are very large. And, and, and we need to kind of be concerned with that. And it's not the case that, for example, the returns for apprenticeship plumbers in terms of lifetime earnings are the same as for apprenticeship hairdressers or health and social care people. So the average here probably um, detracts from the heterogeneity there. And we need to probably do more disaggregation than, than we perhaps have done so far. So my first question was, how much disaggregation is feasible, possible to reflect the complexities in that other 50%? My second point is about spillovers and externalities and signaling. So national accounting, even done this way, including the intangibles, still treats education essentially as individualistic. And rather than recognizing, for example, the importance of interdependencies and spillovers, and, and that's a clearly a key contribution of having a more education, educated workforce. The fact that they're able to work together and the whole is then greater than the sum of the parts. And, and it's how we, how we, I suppose, recognize that in our system of national accounts. And education is productive for health, for example. There are spillovers from education. So the lifetime earnings premium will, some, will reflect some of that. Uh, people live longer, and so there'll be more lifetime earnings. Their survival rates will be higher. But it's also the case of the quality of the life that they will be leading as a consequence of being more educated is also greater. And how do we, how do we encompass that with our, within our national accounting system? That's clearly important. So is there anything we can do within this accounting framework to capture these other dimensions of the social values of educational investment in spillovers and in terms of quality of life? The third thing was the interpretation of the results that we get. I wasn't perhaps, this isn't, you know, my, my expertise isn't really in this area. Um, I wondered whether there was a compositional effect here. I, I, I go back to this fact that, um, uh, the calculation of lifetime earnings 
um, discounted. Um, you know, Mary touched on this. I'm running out of time. Mary touched on this around to the end. How robust are these estimates, the assumptions we're making, making, for example, about the growth rate of future earnings and the discount rate that we should apply? So the growth rate of future earnings, you know, the, the past isn't necessarily a good predictor of the future. We know that there are lots of graduates in what we might call non-graduate jobs. I don't like that phrase. Um, but essentially, that's the kind of language that's being used here. And when we calculate the, the returns to these, uh, the lifetime earnings premium that these individuals, um, when they hit the labor market, having been through the schooling system, will achieve, to what extent are we able to really use, uh, obtain robust estimates of those lifetime earnings premiums as a result of their education? Um, so I think there's, there's, a, there's an issue here. And I suppose my question is, how sensitive, and Mary talks about the robustness, how sensitive are the estimates for alternative assumptions, both on lifetime earnings, future lifetime earnings, and on the growth and discount rates that are used, or the ratio of those two things, which is obviously the important thing here when we're discounting future earnings. So those are my three questions. One, um, how much disaggregation do we need to do on the other 50%, the 50% who don't go into HG? Um, is there anything that we can do about spillovers and externalities that arise from education in this framework? And third, how sensitive are these estimates to the assumptions that we're making um, as we go through this process? Um, but you know, all of those things tell me that this is a really important thing that we need to be doing better than we currently do within our systems of national accounting. Thank you. Andy, thanks very much. That was terrific. Um, we are running close to time and I don't want to go beyond time because I know people have got domestic responsibilities and so forth. So um, what I'm going to do is um, thank you for all the questions which have been sent in. Um, could I, if the questioners will forgive me, uh, leave you to email directly the people, um, the sort of detailed questions, because I don't think it's going to help to go through the very detailed questions. I'm going to go around the table and ask everybody what they think the most important missing capital is. Uh, and then I'm going to leave the last word to uh, the ONS, to Adam and Josh, to tell us, since the ONS have organised this session, uh, where the ONS is going uh, on all of this. So, um, Matthew, why don't we start with you on what you think the most important um, capital is? And uh, very quickly, if you don't mind, please. Um, I'd have to put uh, my vote towards institutional capital, the quality of governance. The data that we have on this is just not responsive enough. Mm. And it's not timely enough. Um, we need high frequency quality of governance, trust in government um, and, and the quality of institutions. It's a hugely important asset for the economy and we don't measure it. And it's the low hanging fruit now. Uh, Adam? I'll have to excuse my son just invaded. But, um, no, 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 it's pleasure. I would say, um, natural, I would say natural capital just presents the most existential threat to the in, in Indeed. Uh, Josh? Uh, this is a very controversial question, isn't it? I, I would actually say natural capital as well. I think, um, as Adam was uh, trying, to, trying to say, um, you know, the, the measurement of intangible capital, even of education, are, are important and useful for understanding growth. But if if our un understanding of natural capital helps, you know, keep keep the planet alive, that's arguably much more important. So I w my vote would be for natural capital. Tara? I would have to say human capital, even though, you know, having said that we need a unifying practice, if not a unifying theory, I think, you know, the whole point of that would be to be able to put them next to each other. And what we know from all of this stuff we've heard today and before is that these are huge, big numbers. You know, the missing capitals are by far much bigger than the stuff that we actually do count. And so I find it difficult to prioritize. But I think humans ultimately, um, you know, build all the rest of the capital, either destroy or also help the natural capital side of things. And so, ingenuity of people and application of that ingenuity to making everybody's lives better on the planet, I, I think must be the most important one. Mary? Um, I, I would, should say human capital, but I, I also think natural capital is, is really is the one that we really need to know something about. So can I say both, human capital and natural capital? <laughs> you, you, you can. Uh, Andy? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say skills, actually, because I think the utilization of, of human capital in the way in which we then manage natural capital is the solution that we're looking for. But without the skilled personnel, individuals using those, that productive potential in the best way will never resolve the problem with natural capital. 
Right. God, everybody's been so brief and answering. That's brilliant. I think we've got time for an extra one before we leave the last word, as I say, which is uh, somebody has emailed in a very nice question. Lots of new data out there, big data, machine learning, all those kinds of things. What kind of opportunities are there to measure this stuff better via those types of methods? Tara, I'm going to start with you uh, on the uh, intangible side. Again, really briefly, if you don't mind. Really briefly, I think the opportunities are huge. But with big data, with machine learning, you don't really know what to compare the results to. And so you will also need more traditional methods to see whether, you know, what you're getting out of your machines, you know, let's say web scraping or whatever actually makes any sense. So the calibration is, is going to be important. And so I don't think it's a panacea, but as a complementary way of, again, you know, improving your understanding of the day-to-day -day dynamics of how the world actually works. Is, is important. And of course, it is actually something where, you know, the machine learning stuff in particular is better at dealing with non-linearities than our traditional methods. So big opportunities. Matthew, around these natural capital issues, there are lots of measurement type of challenges. Uh, are there, are some of the, do some of the answers rely, uh, lie in big data and these new, met these new methods which we might use? Absolutely, they do. Um, big data, remote sensing, satellite data, th this is hugely important to um, mm. improving the quality of natural capital data all around the world. Um, and if you're interested, uh, we've just released a paper uh, from the Bennett Institute using machine learning and AI oh, to brilliant. simulate climate risks uh, and how they impact sovereign credit ratings across countries all around the world. So we're already putting it to work. It's a really exciting field. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops. Great. I, I didn't know that, Matthew. That's good to know. Um, I'm going to stop and pass over to Josh for the last word. Uh, Josh, tell us what the ONS has got planned in these various missing capital areas. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I mean, work in all of these areas, we've got teams dedicated to, to, to human capital, to natural capital, to intangible capital, and, and of course, to the traditional measures as well. And the ONS is, is looking closely at the Dasgupta report, which came out recently, and, and thinking about what we can do uh, to respond to that as well. We're looking towards building, building measures that do better account for all of these types of capital, uh, in, 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 in the spirit of sort of beyond GDP and a measure of the total capital stock that really does account for all of this much better. So I think watch this space. There's a lot more to come. Brilliant. Um, well, uh, thank you to all the audience. Uh, please contact uh, the speakers. Uh, thank you to William Tinsley, uh, who the people watching haven't met, but has been on the computer uh, doing the IT for us, which has been really helpful. And um, thank you to all the speakers uh, and to all the discussants. Uh, and thank you again uh, to the audience for sending in um, their comments. Uh, please carry on supporting all of this effort on building natural capital uh, and carry on supporting the Royal Economic Society as well uh, for putting on conferences uh, like this. Um, so at that point, I will stop uh, and William, I think, will close the session. Thank you all very much indeed.